Good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Reniewicz. You may have seen me uh, yesterday hosting the Demo Palooza show. Normally, I would have a t-shirt gun, but we figured the space a little bit too small, and I would probably knock off all the dessert. So we avoided this year, but last year was uh, quite a show that we've done, me and my partner. I've also hosted the um, uh, Data Science Crash Course yesterday, if uh, you stopped by that you've hopefully learned a few things about AI and things you can do with machine learning and deep learning in general. And uh, starting with Hortonworks uh, a little bit over three years ago, now Cloudera, uh, what I've been doing was basically working with Spark and creating a lot of different assets from tutorials to Spark actual crash courses too, uh, when it was still like the hottest thing that was out there, including some machine learning uh, with Spark and distributed processing using uh, their libraries back then. Um, and nowadays, what I mostly do is basically cover some updates to the uh, Spark itself. So let's get started. What you might have seen um, kind of developing in quite a while is essentially two different communities. One would be the Spark community, where uh, everything would be about you know data frames, data frame-based APIs. Um, interact with all kinds of data sources, over 50 kinds of data sources that you could just pull in straight into Spark. Um, you've heard and probably seen talks about you know data and machine learning pipelines and Spark specific APIs just to do that. Of course, structured streaming and more recently continuous streaming, um, Pandas UDF introduction with the Spark 2.3 and 2.4, and of course, all the different languages. And on the other side, you would have everything that relates to specific machine learning, especially deep learning recently with um, you know, libraries such as TensorFlow and PyTorch, and specific interfaces such as TF Data, TF Transform, um, for distributed processing, Horovood, I never really know how to pronounce it properly. And of course, you know, the classical libraries such as NumPy, SciPy, uh, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, and so forth. So, the problem um, that's been addressed and that's been under this project called Project Hydrogen is like how do we combine these two? And really what this session is all about is highlighting the uh, discrepancies between one community and the other and uh, the inability to really run the workloads in the same way as we did with Spark in the past and highlighting some of the differences and uh, what's been introduced to um, ameliorate that specific uh, need for um, combining deep learning frameworks, especially with the Spark pipelines. So what do we actually need? Well, when you actually build a data slash machine learning pipeline that fetches all of these uh, training samples from, say, HDFS or Hive uh, model in parallel, you need to apply um, this deep learning model to a batch or streaming data set to get the predicted result. And again, the way you do it with these frameworks, especially deep learning frameworks, is quite different than what's been done in Spark historically. The difference is that in Spark, you have a different execution model than you do with these distributed deep learning models. With Spark, tasks are run independently of each other. And uh, you probably have seen that partial tasks can be started and especially if there's no enough resources and restart it as needed if they fail for whatever reason or if they're slow. And usually the Spark itself can do it in and of itself without actual uh, inference from uh, the user. With distributed deep learning, on the other hand, uh, the tasks are coordinated with the master node. And all the jobs that are being um, running, they need to simultaneously synchronize with each other and work and communicate with each other. A better way to visualize it is that you know, you could have, for example, these three different tasks starting to run, and if one of them fails, then you can just restart it. Whereas with distributed deep learning, all of them have to communicate. It could be RPC, it could be MPI. And that challenge is highlighted that you cannot combine one with the other. So with the Spark one, you know, you just restart the tasks, and that kind of approach does not work for this distributed model training. Basically what happens with the distributed model training, if one crashes, you have to restart all of them because they have to be synchronized. 
So what's been introduced in 2.4 is this idea of the bear execution mode. And really all there is is that bear's uh, scheduling called the gang scheduling uh, is being run on top of the existing MapReduce execution mode. Gang, you can think of, you know, I was talking to one of our uh, technical guys, and he's like, so how do you explain gang? He's like, well, you can think of like this beehive, and when they fly and they separate too far, they kind of gang out back uh, together, so the flies don't, you know, the bees don't actually fly out and, um, and, and, and you know, get lost in some way, right? So there's got to be this continuous synchronization between, say, all the bees. So similarly, with this gang scheduling, you've got to have this synchronization between all these different tasks. So now, with the barrier execution mode, um, all these distributed deep learning jobs can be run inside um, your Spark job. What that helps you with, of course, is now you can create these pipelines that you could not create before. Um, and the reason is that you know we've seen two models, two ways of approaching this previously. For example, you would have you know your sources on on the one end. So this could be your Kafka's. This could be some you know. S3s on, on Amazon, some Azure storage, or your on-prem HDFS storage coming into a Spark cluster where all these tasks would be executed, for example, to have an ETL process, so you're doing all this transformation of data. And then you would have to write the results of that process to some intermediate file system. So for example, it could be HDFS. Then when you run the deep learning job, you would pull that information, all these ready data set from that file system and execute them on a separate cluster. So you would have two different ways of you know, billing it and that Spark mentality, that approach was basically incompatible for training deep learning jobs because of different ways of scheduling. So, and there was another one of actually running it within the Spark, sort of, and trying to hopefully uh, get the task completed unless stuff failed. So there was like uh, TensorFlow on Spark and a few others, but that never really worked properly. And that never worked properly because you needed a different scheduler. You needed that gang scheduler. So with that, what happens is now with bare scheduling, I'll show you the code in a moment. When one of these tasks fails, specifically for the deep learning mode, training the models in this distributed deep learning mode, then you just restart the tasks and make sure that they complete successfully. And only when they do, then you can go, for example, and ingest another uh, mini batch if you're training uh, your deep learning model. So you would go for one mini batch. If it executes successfully on your distributed platform, then you can go and grab another one. But if something in between happens, for example, one of the tasks is running too slow or fails, then you just restart all of them until you successfully complete. So now with this barrier execution mode, and basically just rdd.barrier, it tells Spark to launch the tasks together. You also have this context.barrier that places a global barrier and waits until all the tasks in this stage hit it. So basically, if I go and map all the partitions, let me see if I can point over here. I get my context with task.context. Con task let me give a sip of water here. And then I do all of the things that I need to do for my deep learning in this, um, in this commented state over here until I finish. So basically, I'm waiting until all of it is done, until all the tasks finish successfully before continuing on. If you're building a pipeline, so for example, you're loading your data set, you're building your data set. I mean, this is a typical um, way of just bring all the images. So for example, you're, I don't know, you're running convolutional neural nets and just training your deep learning model with that to recognize you know, your cats and dogs. You got your data set. And now if you wanted to put within the pipeline, you would basically um, well, write something similar to this. So now I have my data set that's basically using this rdd.barrier function. Um, and now I can basically create a function or method, and that's called run distributed training, and I'm just going to be working on all these batches. So we can think of these mini batches in the context of deep learning, for example. So this partition id equals equals zero is basically if it's zero, and essentially, uh, you know, you always have a partition zero, so you just go basically to that one, is 
all the scripts that you need to run for setting up whatever your deep learning environment, I mean, anything that needs to be set up for uh, training that deep learning model, for example, you know, saving something uh, at the end to HDFS, this is where you do it, and then um, everything else is basically all the, all the slaves and nothing happens on that. So you run that, and basically, until it completes, it basically holds it with the context that barrier. So all these tasks have to communicate and execute successfully using that gang scheduler until it's done. And only then you can move on. So what this helps you with is now you can have the unifying execution model. So like I mentioned, um, in step one, in the stage one, it's usually what you could do before um, with, with Spark, and you can still do today. So you could execute these Sparks the way you're doing with everything else. And you can do your ETL, you can do your data transformation, you can bring in you know, your streaming data, whatnot. Then in stage two, using that barrier execution mode, you would run your deep learning training, your distributed deep learning training, make sure that that completes. And when it does complete, then you can go to stage three, which is basically, again, going back to your typical Spark execution of, um, of you know, you're pushing data out or you know, connecting to, to other um, things and whatnot. So this actually is, is very nice because now using Spark, you can have entire pipeline and it's uh, you know, properly written and uh, you have the right approach of doing this, which was not possible before. And finally, it, it does work the way it's supposed to. So that's pretty much it for this, this whole session on you know, what, what it is with this distributed um, deep learning training and the gang schedule is really the big piece. So let me just mention a few more things with Spark 3 uh, that's coming up. This is going to be the optimized data exchange. That's going to be very interesting. And the accelerator aware scheduling. With the optimized data exchange, specifically it's um, Apache Arrow, one thing, um, if you haven't seen this before, is basically it allows to more efficient information exchange between uh, you know, different data frames, for example, Spark and Pandas data frames, and the different um, uh, frameworks that you might be using in the engines themselves. So now with Apache Arrow, you don't need to do, for example, this expensive serialization and deserialization, and you can integrate it much, much quickly. So this will be definitely coming up, and this will speed up um, a lot of the workloads that you're doing. With the accelerator aware scheduling, uh, there are multiple goals. Uh, one of them is basically to utilize all the different accelerators you might have. So in your heterogeneous, heterogeneous environment, you might have GPUs, FPGAs, and whatever else is coming up, TPUs perhaps. Um, and now you'll be able to utilize all of them um, to reach your goals. So basically users will submit a Spark application, request all the GPU resources, uh, and then you can assign how many GPUs per tasks, for example, per specific RDD stage or Pandas UDF that you want to use, you would want to assign them. And what that allows you to do is that now you, you can make sure that all these tasks have sufficient resources that should be allocated so that um, you, know, you actually complete these tasks in, in a timely manner. So here's a very simple code. Uh, basically, now you're making sure that your accelerator is aware of all the different resources. And you are saying that, you know, I need two GPUs uh, per tasks. So I need, for example, these powerful P100s to be used for this specific task. Um, and with that, basically, this is really what I want to talk about, you know, talk about in this session. So if you have other questions, then just come up and we'll chat a little more. Thank you. And if you have questions, then go ahead and we can chat them like right now. But uh, you know, I'll just be here, so feel free to check out other sessions. So this is just you know a very quick one, uh, kind of like introduction. Yes. Mm -hmm. The gang schedule. Yes. So, yeah, let's let's chat offline about that because it gets a little bit more complex. But yeah, yes. Well, I think it was on the slide 14 when you showed the code. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah. So 
So it's basically setting up all these different scripts for, for the actual training. But you, know, you, you might have all, multiple partitions, and then the, you know, they'll be actually running and pulling all this data from the different partitions and training on it. But this is where all these scripts, if you wanted to set up for the distributed learning, that's where they'll be running. OK, so that means that anyway, you will pull them in one location. Right, exactly. Well, yeah, let me, let me think on that. I'll have to get back on you on that one, because so from the memory issue, we haven't, so we haven't experimented enough on that to see how it actually uh, grabs all the memory that it would require for it to be sufficiently uh, high enough. But yeah, uh, let me double check. So I've got one of the engineers, Yambo Liang, is basically working on the source code. So I'll ping him afterwards. So let me know, and I'll get back to him, and then you know he'll be able to update on that. Cool. Thank you. Um, but I have actually I have another code over here. Yeah. So this one's actually pretty cool too. So for the RDD. The error to RDD, if you're interested, this is another example of how that will be executed in the future with the uh, vectorized computing. 